1 Corinthians chapter number 1. When you find your place, stand with me, please. Let's begin reading in verse 17. Paul said, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God Amen and amen. I want to preach this thought this morning, two perspectives of the cross. Two perspectives of the cross. Lord, help us this morning as we expound these verses of Scripture. May the Holy Spirit of God work in our hearts and may uh, God's people be stirred and challenged and changed if need be today as a result of this message. In Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated. Paul talked a lot about the cross of Christ. He's talking about it a lot in these verses. But in our text this morning, he brought out that there are two different outlooks on the cross of Christ, depending on whether or not you're a believer or an unbeliever. We're going to look at that this morning throughout the course of the message. But before we get to our verse number 18, which is where I want to take the text. I want to just back up and look at verse 17, if I could, and just kind of give us a little bit of introduction into what Paul is talking about here. There is a report of divisions leading up to our text this morning in verse number 10. Paul said, I, I hear that there's divisions among you. And um, I'm, he said, I'm, I'm disappointed, in essence, of what he was saying. And he goes on and finds out that there has been uh, contentions and quarrels in the church at Corinth. He said in verse number uh, 10, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. That was Paul's desire for the church at Corinth, and them all be on the same page and to be unified. He said in verse number 11, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, I guess he read it on her Facebook, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I'm of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I am of Cephas. Cephas was another name for Simon Peter. He said, you've got, you've got divisions and groups of people. They're picking sides, picking teams. And, and some saying, I'm of Paul. Some says, I'm of Apollos. He was a very eloquent man that was very mighty in the word. And then the book of Acts talks about Apollos. And some says, I'm of Cephas. And then you've got that super spiritual crowd that says, I'm of Christ. And he goes on and says in verse number 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the house of Stephanus, or Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. So that is leading up to what he said in verse number 17. There was divisions. There were schisms. There was people in the church saying, well, I'm of Paul. Paul baptized me. This other group said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm of Peter. I like Peter better than Paul. I'm Peter... Peter's my man. And then you've got some says, well, I like Apollos. I'm, I'm a follower of Apollos. And then, then you've got that crowd that says, well, I don't like any of them except Christ. He's the only one I like. He's the only one I'm following. He's the only one I'm going to be a disciple of. And he said, that's what Paul said, it was, was, is the house of Christ, is Christ divided? Or why are you doing this? You're one body. You're one group of believers uh, saved by the grace of God and dwelt by the Holy Spirit and Living, living as Christians, why are you so divided? Why are there so many schisms? And then he just begins to remember. He said, I'm really glad I didn't baptize any more of you than I did because you'd be thinking that uh, I baptized you in the name of Paul. He said, you totally miss what's, what, what the main thrust of the church is all about. That's why he said what he did in verse number 17. 
So I'll just give you three things by way of introduction, just out of verse number 17. Notice Paul's commission. Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Now you could, you could I guess, take exception with Paul by referring to the Great Commission, where he said, uh, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. So the commission to the church, obviously, was to get people saved and baptized and disciple. So don't think that Paul is disputing or minimizing that, but what Paul is doing in the context of this debate and these schisms over who baptized who, Paul says, I want you to understand something. I'm not really that concerned about who baptizes the new converts. My main concern, my main commission as an apostle of Jesus Christ was to preach the word of God. They're forming schisms in the body. They're creating divisions over who baptized who. I was personally, I was baptized by Dr. Harold B. Seitler, a tremendous prince of preachers. I have jokingly told people that's how I know I'm saved. I was baptized by Dr. Seitler. I'm just joking, obviously, a little tongue in cheek. Uh, Dr. Seitler had nothing to do with my salvation experience, but as an eight-year-old boy, I had the privilege of being baptized by Dr. Seitler. Uh, but that doesn't make me more saved or even more baptized by, than anybody else. It not, has nothing to do with who baptizes. The baptism is just an outward profession of an inward possession. That's all it is. Uh, an outward testimony of the fact that I've been saved by God's grace and I'm not ashamed of it. And so Paul wasn't concerned about who baptized them. In fact, he's rebuking them for making such a big issue out of it. That was his ultimate concern. His burning passion was uh, getting people saved. His passion was opening up the scriptures and preaching Christ crucified. That's what Paul's commission was. That's what he's talking about in verse number 17. And just in case you think that Paul is minimizing baptism, go through the book of Acts and look at every time he led somebody to the Lord, the people that got led to the Lord got baptized right then. I mean, literally got baptized right then. He went down to the river where Lydia and the group of women were down there praying. He went down there and they got saved and baptized in the river right then. Right. Remember the Ethiopian eunuch? Got baptized. He wanted to get baptized before he got saved. Oh, yeah. And Philip said, no, no, no. He, uh, the Ethiopian eunuch said, there's water right over there. What does it hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, you got to get saved first, big guy. You got to get born again first. You got to believe. He said, I believe. He said, if you believe, then we'll get you baptized. The Bible says they went down into the water and baptized. And the Bible says they came up out of the water. I mean, deep water baptisms all through the book of Acts. Yeah. In fact, there's a story about Paul being beaten and thrown into a prison in a place called Philippi. And he's in there at night. And the Bible says that there was an earthquake and the chains fell off. The doors opened up and the jailer came in and would have killed himself. Uh, but when he saw that Paul and, the, and, and, and Silas were still there, Paul said, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The Bible says the jailer said, brethren, what must I do to be saved? And the Bible says that Paul led the, uh, the, the, the Philippian jailer to Christ at midnight and they went out in the middle of the night and got baptized. Right. Read the story. You want to talk about emphasizing baptism, they went and found a creek or a stream or a river or a pond or a water fountain in the town square in the middle of the night and he and his whole family got baptized and then they came back in and they washed their, their backs and they, they, they took care of them but they got baptized, I'm talking immediately after salvation. But Paul said, I don't want you to get, get the cart before the horse here. You gotta get saved and my burning passion is to make sure people get saved. It doesn't matter to me who baptizes you as long as it's done properly and scripturally uh, through the authority of the local church and it's done in deep water, he says, I, that's not what I'm looking to do is to rack up a bunch of baptisms. I'm trying to get people saved. Right. Paul's commission. Then we see Paul's communication in verse number 17. He says, for, uh, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words. Notice Paul's communication. The gospel message is not a sales pitch. It's not something that can be presented in a way that is inoffensive and politically correct. That's the problem now. They're trying to take the gospel and make it politically correct and they're in, in doing so, they have made the word of God, the gospel, the preaching of the cross of none effect. 
Somebody might say, well, Pastor Shifflin, I know we'd probably have more people come to Calvary if you didn't preach so hard. <laughs> FYI, I knew that before you said that. <laughs> but I can't dilute the gospel. I know that if we changed the gospel, if we, if, we took the, uh, the, 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 if we took the cross out and we took the, the blood out and we took uh, the sin out and we took hell out of it, we'd probably get a lot more people, but then you've got nothing. It's not something that can be presented in an inoffensive and politically correct manner. The gospel of, in and of itself is confrontational. It is offensive, it's personal, and it's unattractive. It deals with sin, it deals with guilt, it deals with blood, it deals with death, it deals with hell, it deals with matters of life or death. In our text here in verse number 23, Paul said we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. That would be a modern day word to describe that would be, it's, it's scandalous. It's, it's, it's something that people would just recoil from in, 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 in disgust and say, goodness gracious, I don't want to have anything to do with that. He says, we know the preaching of the cross to the Jews is a stumbling block. We know that it is, a, it is a, uh, 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 something that people are not interested in hearing, but Paul wasn't a salesman. He was a preacher of the gospel. He wasn't concerned about his oratory skills. We see that in chapter number two, verse one. Brethren, when I came to you, I came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you, he said in verse number uh, four, my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Paul wasn't interested in being eloquent. He was more interested in presenting the facts and the truth of the gospel. His communication was not enticing in verse chapter two, verse four. He says, I know that when I'm up preaching that unsaved people are not sitting there going, oh, that sounds awesome, I need to do that. That's not how it works. That's not how they, that you can't make the gospel appealing to lost people. Right. Amen. There's not a single lost person when they hear the gospel says, oh man, this makes me feel great. No, it makes you feel terrible. The gospel tells you that you're lost and that you're a sinner and that you're going to hell. So Paul said, my communication is not with wisdom of words. I'm not playing mind games. I'm not, I'm not spinning a yarn. I'm not telling a fable. I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to sell something to you. I'm telling you what the Bible says and what God said. So we see Paul's commission, Paul's communication. Thirdly, we see in verse number 17, Paul's concern. Paul said, my biggest concern is that when we preach the gospel, that we don't do it with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What a statement. Paul was extremely concerned about the message not having the power, the effect that it was supposed to have. Paul knew the full potential of the gospel. He knew the difference that the gospel could make in a life. He was full living proof of that. He was concerned about the dynamite of the gospel not being hindered by the delivery of the gospel. Paul was concerned about the power of the gospel not being drowned out by personalities. Amen. Paul was concerned about the integrity of the message not being diluted by the intentions of the messenger. There's a lot of people today, they are entertained by preaching. Oh, he is a good preacher. He's a good preacher. He knows how to weave the story. He knows how to insert the jokes and the illustrations and tie all the verses together. And he knows how to bring you up to an emotional high. And he knows how to bring you down. He knows how to get them down the aisle. And, and I'm telling you, Paul said, I'm not interested in being an eloquent, enticing speaker uh, with man's words. I just want to preach the gospel. I want to preach the truth. That was what he said in verse number 17. Then we get to verse number 18, and we notice there are two different perspectives of the cross of Christ. Let me give both of them to you right quick. Number one, to the sinner, it is foolishness. To the sinner, it is foolishness. He said in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. We know who he's talking about when he says to them that perish. He's referring to the unbeliever, those that have not been saved by the grace of God. We see that word in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, 
but have everlasting life. So he's referring to those that have not been saved, those that have never been born again, those that have not received Christ as their savior. He's referring to them as those that perish. Why is the preaching of the cross foolishness to the sinner? Number one, it's foolishness because of the man that was on the cross. All the way back in Isaiah 53, the Bible says in verse number five, he was despised, or verse number three, he is despised. Talking about Jesus now. This is a prophecy about Jesus. All the way back in Isaiah, he is despised yes. and rejected of men. Right. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not twice. In Isaiah 53, verse number three, the Bible uses the word he was despised to describe the attitude of people towards the Lord Jesus Christ. It's essential for you and I to understand this morning, Jesus Christ has never been popular. Being a follower of Jesus Christ has never been popular. It was predicted in the Old Testament that he would be despised and rejected of men as we just read. He was called in Psalm 118, verse number 22, the stone that the builders rejected and it was referred to in the Gospels three times. Matthew, Mark, and Luke referred to Psalm 118, verse number 22, where he said, it's the stone that the builders rejected. Right. We're gonna be building a welcome center this week back here and we've got some stone that we've ordered They'll be coming in in boxes and we'll be forming up and doing some beautiful columns back there just to kind of accent that wall. And if we get, if I, if I, if I reach down in that box and I grab a, a, a corner or I grab a, a section of that stone and it's broken and it's busted and it's cracked, I will set it to the side. I will not use that. What he's referring to here, those of us that are in the building uh, industry, have the building experience uh, as a builder, uh, if there was a building material that we rejected, which is what he's talking about, this is the stone that the builders rejected, it would be that building material that we rejected because it was ugly, it was unattractive, it was worthless, it was damaged. Uh, we would, whenever we would get the stack of lumber to build the house, we would have to go through there and call out all the twisted, gnarled up, and broken boards. We had an old stack of boards. We call it the call. Call it out. Grab those two by eights, two by tens, grab it, I'd pick it up and look down it, and if it was twisted and it was crooked, we'd set it to the side and we'd cut them up and use them for headers and different things. We couldn't use it because it was unattractive, it wasn't unappealing, and they referred to Jesus as the stone that the builders rejected. We don't want him. Right. Right. He's never been, it's never, it's never been cool to be a Christian. People in the streets before Pilate's Hall chose Barabbas over the Lord Jesus Christ. Pilate stood there and said, I, I, I've looked at Jesus. I've, I've talked to him. I find no fault in him. He said it twice. They said, give us Barabbas. He was, a, he was a murderer. He was a malefactor. He was a thief. He was a convicted criminal. They said, we'd rather have him than Jesus. I'm talking about the different perspectives of the cross to the sinner. The preaching of the cross is foolishness because of the man on the cross. The problem is to reject Jesus Christ is to reject the only way to God. Well, I love this verse right here, 1 Timothy 2, verse number five. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. He's the only one that can reach up and grab the hand of God and reach down into the pits and the muck and the mire of sin and grab the hand of fallen man and reconcile them together. Jesus is the only one that can do that. He's... To the sinner, the preaching of the cross is foolishness because of the man on the cross. Secondly, because of the message of the cross. The central message of the cross is that Jesus died to pay for my sins and for your sins. That makes it unattractive right there. And you can, you can glorify, we glorify the cross. We've got one behind us with, with beautiful lighting inside of it and we wear jewelry and, and, and we wear it on t-shirts and we put it on signs and we incorporate it into our logos and things of that nature. But the cross is a symbol of suffering and shame. And to adhere to this message of the cross means a person has to both admit 
that he or she is a sinner and that they need salvation. And a lot of people don't want to do that. The message of the cross is that mankind is unable to redeem himself in a fallen state. And so when you start talking about the cross, it's foolishness to those that perish because they don't want to address the sin problem. They don't want to address their inadequacy to be reconciled with God. They don't want to admit they need Jesus Christ. Not only is it foolishness because of the man and the message, but thirdly, it is foolishness to the sinner because of the mandate of the cross. The mandate of the cross is clear that we can in no way get to God without Jesus Christ. There is no other way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You won't work your way to heaven. You won't give enough money to go to heaven. You won't, you won't take care of enough sick people and elderly people to get to heaven. You can't abide by enough laws, do enough good to earn heaven. The mandate of the cross is that God hates sin and he cannot accept us in our fallen sinful state. The mandate of the cross is that the wages of sin is death. The mandate of the cross is that there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The mandate of the cross is that rejection of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ results in a sentence to an everlasting eternal hell. And so the mandate of the cross, that alone makes it unappealing and unattractive. Oh, you mean to tell me if I don't get saved, I'm gonna go to hell? Is that what you're telling me? No, that's what God said. And they scoff and they make fun of that. They mock that. The preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But to the sinner, it is foolishness, but secondly, to the saint, it is a fulfillment. I'm telling you what, it's fulfillment. If you've ever been saved by the grace of God, you know that those that scoffing and mocking and laughing at the cross is definitely on the wrong side of history. I'm telling you, if you ever accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, those of us that have been saved by the grace of God wouldn't go back and we wouldn't undo that for a million dollars. It's the greatest day in our life, the day we accepted Christ as our personal savior. It's fulfillment to the saint because of God's promise. The preaching of the cross Give a, gave us a promise. That promise was that we could be saved. That's what we needed was salvation. Notice Paul referred to it in verse number 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The promise it, uh, it refers to it again in verse number 21. Look at what he says. He says, uh, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. I just like that word save, don't you? I've asked people before, have you ever been saved? I said, well, I was drowning one time and my uncle pulled me out of the pond. We're not talking about that kind of save. We're not talking about that kind of save. We're talking about saved from the flames of hell saved. We're talking about saved from sin saved. And the promise again is in Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So while the unbelievers are mocking and scoffing at the preaching of the cross and to them it's foolishness, we rejoice in it because for us it's the fulfillment of the promise that if we put our faith in what happened at the cross, we would be saved. That's right. Amen. The Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Believe on Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Amen, it's a, it was a promise that was fulfilled. Now some people won't get saved or don't think they can get saved because the devil tells them they've sinned too much. You'd be surprised if people sit through a message like this and say, I can't get saved, I, I'm too bad. You got some people that think they're too good. And you got this crowd over here says, preacher, I'm telling you, if you know all the stuff I've done, you know there ain't no way in the world he'd save me. Yes, he will. Yes, sir. Amen. <laughs> all of them that come to me, I will in no wise cast out, he said. What a verse, amen. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'm telling you right now, he died for every man, woman, child, teenager. He died for everybody. And we, we put our faith in the preaching of the cross and it fulfilled that promise that we could be saved. Brother Rossi stood up here Friday night and preached to our teenagers. Said he was in prison looking at 20 years. <laughs> I didn't ask him what he did, I don't wanna know. But it wasn't stealing hubcaps, I can tell you that. Right. Right. He'd done something wrong, he'd done something bad. He got saved. Saved. <laughs> right. Hallelujah. 
to the saint, the preaching of the cross is fulfillment of God's promise. Secondly, of God's provision. The provisions listed in verse number 30. Boy, I wish I had time to just elaborate on all these words in verse number 30. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Every single one of those is a message in and of itself. What God provided for the believer through the preaching of the cross, it'd take forever, it'd take the rest of eternity to try and begin to explain. We can't even begin to explain what happened to us when we got saved. Most people live their whole Christian life never even beginning to comprehend what God did in their heart. That miracle that was performed in their heart, that moment that they believed, changed their eternal destiny. I mean, whether you were bowing at this altar, whether you was praying in your seat, whether you were praying down, going down the road in your car or at the house by your bed, when you bowed your head and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, he changed your eternal destiny. He changed everything about you. He even, he even changed who your father was. Your father was the devil, but now your father's God. And now you're joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You went from being a broke and you went from being in debt and, and not being able to even come close to paying the sin debt to being joint heirs with Jesus Christ and having everything. Can you believe that? Oh, that's why we don't like, that's why we like preaching on the cross. I had a man in my church one time said, Pastor, don't ever apologize for preaching on the cross. He said, the lost need it and the saved love it. Amen. That's, where, that's where it all happened, was at the cross. It was a fulfillment of God's promise. It's a fulfillment of God's provision. Thirdly and lastly, the, to the saint, the preaching of the cross is fulfillment. It's a fulfillment of God's power. Paul used it several times. He referred to it in verse number 17, but he didn't really use the word, but he, he is... He is uh, he referred to it, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. He said, I don't want to rob the preaching of the cross of Christ of its power, of its impact. What was a great day in my ministry when I realized that the power is not in my eloquence or in my presentation. The power is in the gospel. Yes. Amen. Your power as a soul winner. You say, I, I would witness more. I would... I would tell Jesus, uh, people about Jesus more, but I'm afraid I'm going to say something wrong. Oh, you're definitely going to say something wrong. That's right. Preachers that have been to Bible college and been preaching for years, sometimes we misspeak and we say the wrong thing. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. But the power is in the, is in the yes. gospel. Yes. The power is in the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen. And I take great consolation in the fact that as long as I'm preaching this book, my preaching is going to have power. Amen. I'm telling you, Paul said several times, the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power yes. of God. What a blessing. He got over to chapter number two, talked about it some more. He said, and uh, he said, and I came not to you with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. Verse number three, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. That doesn't sound like power to me. That doesn't sound like a really strong, confident, eloquent speaker up trying to, trying to sell something on somebody or try to convince people of something. He says, I came to you in weakness and in fear and in trembling and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Why? Verse five, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of God but in the power of God. Yes. Not in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. He said, I don't want you leaving the service and saying, man, that's a really good preacher. I want you to leave saying, my, what a savior. Yeah. And the power, the preaching of the cross, that's what confronted us. Do you remember where you were the first time you heard somebody preach on the cross? Yes, that's what confronted us. The preaching of the cross is what confounded us. The preaching of the cross is what convicted us. The preaching of the cross is what converted us. Yes. Our faith does not stand in the wisdom of words. Chapter one, verse 17. It's not with wisdom of words. We got, we got a lot of people in going to Bible college trying to learn how to be a, a good preacher. 
And I made a statement one time. I probably didn't win many friends because I was at a Bible college when I said it. I said, if we'd spend our Bible college time trying, instead of trying to produce great preachers, produce great Christians. Yeah. Yeah. The, Bible, the Bible will pack the punch. Yeah. That's right. Amen. That's good. That's right. The Word of God's got the... Hey, why do you think we just put a few verses on the back of a gospel track and pass them out? Right. They got power to them. Yes, sir. By the way, you look it up when you get home. That word power is dynamite. In the Greek, right. it's dynamite. Yeah. Dynamite. Dynamite. You didn't know when you was handing somebody an outreach card or a gospel track that you was giving them a stick of dynamite, did you? Come on, that's right. Yeah. They read those verses. They read those verses that are inspired by the very breath of God. Come on. And I tell you what, they can't get rid of it. It'll be in their heart. It'll be in their mind. That's right. Amen. Our faith does not stand in the wisdom of words. It doesn't stand, chapter 2, verse 5, in the wisdom of men. Our faith stands in the power of God. Yes. Two perspectives to the preaching of the cross this morning, to the sinner, to the sinner, ah, it's just foolishness. They laugh, they make fun. And they, there's a lot of you maybe did that before you got saved. Brother, Brother Rossi told his testimony Friday night. He said, I said, leave me alone. I don't want to hear it. Somebody tried to give him a Bible. I don't want to hear it. Somebody tried to give him a gospel message. I don't want to hear it. I'm not interested in what you got to say. But he got somewhere and heard some preaching and went, oh my word, I didn't know I was lost and going to hell. That's the most powerful thing I've ever heard in my life. Exactly. And he got saved and it changed that old jailbird into a preacher of the gospel. Yes, yeah. Now I was only four years old when I got saved, but the change in my life was just as, just as real. Amen. Just as real. Yeah. Changed my life. It changed many of your lives. Yes. Yes. There may be somebody here today that's never been saved. Never, never accepted Jesus Christ. You're part of that crowd he referred to as those that perish. Yeah, right. If you died on the way home from church, if you got killed in a car wreck on the way home from church today and you've never been saved, you'd wake up in hell right. and it'd be too late to do anything about it. Yeah, right. But if you get saved today, no matter what you did yesterday or last year or in the last 20 years or in the last 50 years, no matter what you did, like, right. like that sinner on the cross, he got saved right then, and Jesus said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed.